everybody, this is Will Murphy coming to you from Mac Lighting in Los Angeles. Welcome to today's Tech Talks. As usual, I'm joined by my colleague Kat Covell. Hey, Will Murphy. <laughs> um, so, I uh, hope you guys are enjoying the Tech Talks. As you probably noticed last week, last week, two weeks ago, we uh, got a bunch of uh, existing Tech Talks up on our Tech Talks YouTube channel, uh, which you can see here on the Acolyting YouTube. Uh, not every single one is uh, recorded correctly, and uh, therefore they don't all exist. So we would encourage you to join them just in case something goes wrong. And uh, um, we can't. Um, so today's kickoff topic is about tracking. Uh, feel free to post your questions along the way. If anything comes up, hits your mind, just uh, type it there. Kat's going to take a look at those, and we'll get to those right after I talk about tracking for a little while. And uh, remember, you can ask any and all questions that you want. So um, I kind of made a I made a view here uh, of a, a channel sheet, uh, and I made kind of a mini cue list that shows what tracked values look like. So um, tracking basically says that once you set an attribute to a value, it will stay there until you tell it to do something else. This is kind of the concept of latest takes precedence. Um, some of the history of it, uh, the idea of tracking kind of came from the days of Rio stat dimmers, where if you push a handle up, it's not going to move until you actually pull it back down. sequence option um, we did assign we did the assign menu a couple weeks ago which is the title bar of the executor you can go to uh, options and turn off tracking here if you want to do just um, Q Q to Q independent values per Q so uh, in a particular tracking list this is my tracking sheet and if you've never seen one before uh, you have an empty space you have the sheets tab and you do sequence tracking. Um, right here, the in the first queue, I did store channel one at open, channel two, three, and four at closed. Um, and then in the second queue, I take channel one to 50. Um, in, in channel two, though, it doesn't do anything, so it stays closed, which is represented by the little dot. And Channel three, I take it to 50. Um, you'll notice that the green, the green value exists because it's the dimmer value going down. Uh, cyan value indicates that there's actually a hard stored value there, or in this case, the dimmer is going up. And magenta indicates tracked values. So now I know I can store my next queue and all those in Q7, all those lights are still at exactly the same place. Uh, when it comes to dimmers, uh, this is useful because you can set your levels and, and not have to worry about changing them. Now, I talked about latest takes precedence. Um, when it comes to moving lights, tracking becomes very helpful because you have a lot more attributes. If you point that light on the singer, you want it to stay there, but you might change the color. So let's see if I grab fixture 101. Uh, I put it at 50%. Um, forget about this macro real quick. This gives me access to my presets here. So we point it on the singer. And now I have a dimmer at 50 pointed on the singer. And I'm going to store this to my second executor. Uh, if we select that executor, I can actually see it in the queue list. So we'll see we got that light at 50% and it's pointed at the singer. Now instead for the next cue, I want it to stay on the singer and I want it to be, uh, let's say, uh, red. So I make it red. I see it's red. I want to store this as my next cue. So I say store please, create second cue. I didn't have to tell it to point to the singer and remain at 50%. It just tracks. So it's just the latest takes precedence kind of um, tracking process. 
tracking is just um, it's useful because it keeps things where you put them until you tell them to go somewhere else. Uh, if we go back to this particular one. Now, let's say I go through this queue list and go back to that view. And I'm sitting in Q4. Now, channel 1 is at 50%. And maybe now it's time for this to, oops, sorry about that. It's time for this to be at 75%. And then I'm going to update Q4. So I choose update. I get this uh, update window, which I'll move to the big screen. And I want to update Q4. Um, I'm just going to hit update Q and notice what happens. When I update Q4, it puts the value at 75% in Q4 and then it tracks forward because remember previously this 50% had been tracking the entire way. I'm going to oops that so you can see where it goes back to. There are some other options associated with update that pertain to, tr to tracking. So if I say update this, I have this button here that says update or up, update, up to tracking update up, or update queue only. Now, if I cho were to choose update queue only, that means only update the value in this queue, but don't allow the value to track forward. So if I say update queue, queue only, you'll notice the value goes to 75% in Q4, but then it goes back to what it was before in Q5. So it goes back to 50%. And that's the concept of Q only. Q only is says, hey, I know there's values that are tracking forward, but I want to put these values in this queue, and I don't want to change anything else about the following queues. So maybe you know that Q5 is perfect, but you're going to make a Q4 and a Q4.1 and a Q4.2, which are different things going on. But when you get to Q5, you want to make sure you preserve the look that you had before. So update Q only is a good idea. Now Q only exists as a store option as well. So if I wanted to store this to Q4 instead of update Q4, I could say store Q4 please. And I get a little checkbox that says Q only merge. And it does the same thing as update Q only. So that's kind of the difference that's uh, the, the tracking stuff. Now another situation that arises is that you're sitting in Q4 and your designer says, you know what, this, everything's a little not quite bright enough. Can you make it 55%? So now he likes this. But he decides he wants it to be 55% for the entire range of cues, so tracking backwards and forwards. This is a function in the update menu that's available. So I set my fixture to 55%, and I say update. And now I'm set to tracking update, so I want it to track forward. And then the question is, do I add it as new content to Q4, or do I add it to where it originally came from? So when I say original contents only, you notice this displays Q2, whereas add new contents displays Q4. So if we move this to screen one, this set original contents displays Q2 because the dimmer value that you've changed channel one that you're trying to set to 55%, originally was being controlled by Q2. Therefore, in the update win window, when you say original content only, you get the option to update Q2 instead. And now when we look at our tracking sheet, that 55%, even though we're in Q4, goes back and updates in Q2, and then 55% tracks all the way down. Um, if you've worked with other consoles, they have different terminology for this. So in the MA platform, it's called original content. Um, other, I've heard other terms like track backwards. Um, cool. I track backwards and forwards. We call it original, original content. Now, you probably noticed there was another option in this update window uh, called Tracking shield. This uh, so we have a tracking update, update queue only, and update tracking shield. This doesn't really apply to dimmers. This is a function for moving lights, and it's a protective feature for the user. Um, 
that's related to changes that you might have made. So I'm going to try an attempt to show you this. Um, it's, it's, the concept of it is that you actually don't need to care about tracking anymore. That's what's really cool, which makes it very difficult to explain. So uh, I would encourage you to use it. If you understand a little bit about tracking, you'll realize that it does really protect you really well. Um, the, the idea that occurs is that, um, hopefully I can, I can show this simple example to help you understand how it works. Just remember, it's protecting you. It's protecting, uh, it's protecting the looks that you've created. So let's see, in Q2, this light is in red, right? And then I may have a situation where I turn this off. And we're going to store a few cues here. And then I bring this light back on to full. And in Q8, I have a alpha spot pointed at my downstage singer in red. But you'll notice these values, the position is tracked and the color is tracked. That means if I make any changes to position or color in Q2 through 7, the look that I've created in Q8 will be broken. So I can prove this. Um, let's say we go into Q5, and for some reason, uh, actually, do something that might be more realistic. Go back. So let's say in Q2, this is red. Um, and now my designer designer decides that in Q2, I want this to be cyan. Go to screen three. So now it's cyan, and I want this to be changed in Q2. Now, Q8 says in full in red. Hmm. Okay, so I will update. Uh, I want to update Q2 tracking, right, etc. And notice what happens is now suddenly my Q8, which was red, is no longer red, it's going to be cyan. This is what happens with tracking. So you as the programmer, historically, have to remember that if you make changes in Q2, double check that you're not affecting any future looks. Because since I turned the dimmer off in Q4 through 7, maybe Q8 is really a totally different look, and it's not supposed to track all the way forward. So we're going to oops that, and I'm going to show you what tracking shield does. So if we say update. Tracking update, oh, update tracking shield. This is nice. Now what happens? The look that I've created in Q8 has been automatically preserved. So this is the concept of tracking shield. So in Q2, the designer wanted it in cyan. Uh, you notice this tracks forward because when the dimmer goes out, we don't want it to crossfade to red. But now when I go into all the way up to Q7 and then I go into Q8, it is still red. Now it is fading into red, and you can fix this problem by using move in black. So in Q8, I want to enable uh, move in black to occur as, I think I'll just say as early as possible. And if I turn this off, we'll be in Q2, and it'll fade out nicely. And then since MIV was set to move in black as early as possible, it has now preset this fixture for the look or the color that's associated with Q8. So tracking shield is a really great way to protect your future looks without having to worry too much about tracking. And I would encourage you to use it, especially if you're not that proficient yet at understanding how to manage tracking. As you noticed before, I had to remember that the cyan, I didn't want the cyan to track into Q8, but since I used tracking shield, I didn't have to worry about it. Um, in case you did want this to track, maybe this another little tracking bit that I'm thinking that just popped up to my head. Sometimes you want to remove values. You can use the tracking sheet for this. You can use store remove, which we covered in a previous webinar that's probably on our YouTube page. You can also right click in this cell, and I could say, delete the selection, and now that cyan value is allowed to track forward. Update tracking shield. Uh, the tracking shield function is also available as a store option. 
So if I'm in Q2 again and I decide to use store instead of update, uh, we could say store Q2, please. Track it shield merge, and you'll see it preserve that cyan. I put the green in here, but it preserved the cyan. And the same thing would happen with your uh, position. So maybe I decided Q2 is not on the singer anymore. It's in green on the keyboardist. But if I store this to Q2, track and shield merge. Now Q8 is still in red on the singer. Track and shield, by the way, is a new thing in this version 3.1. So if you've never heard of it before, it's because it's fairly new. I would definitely encourage you to use it, uh, especially if you're in a really fast-paced programming environment. Um, you don't want to remember, you don't have time to manage all the tracking, just use track and shield, and then you can go back and unblock your queue list earlier. So um, something that you might see happen, um, if you store the same values to the same queues, uh, the values will turn white. So we've seen the cyan, we've seen the green, we've seen the magenta. If I put this alpha spot at 50 and I store this to Q2, uh, you'll notice suddenly this is in white because it's a redundant value. It means that Q2 is the same value as the previous Q. Um, therefore, nothing's going to track forward. So if I store this to Q1, please, you notice Q2 is still at 50. So some people will block values. Um, this is another tracking function of the queue list, block selection, you see, oh, these values are white, which means they won't track forward. So I could essentially lock them in. Uh, you could unblock, if you see a lot of white values in your queue list and you want to unblock things to allow it to track, you could say unblock selected queues or complete, which does the entire queue list. Uh, if we jump back to channels here, um, Select uh, Executor 1, we can see channels. Um, sometimes you might have a, let's say, between Q4 and 5, this is Scene 1 and Scene 2. And you're like, okay, everything that's at the start of Scene 5, I really like this. I want to make sure it always stays that way. Um, you could use Syntax. So I could say Block Q5. Unfortunately, now I go back in my rehearsal and in Q2, I'm like, oh, I need a new fixture over here. So I bring that to full and I store that to Q2, please. And now suddenly Q5, which was scene two, has a new fixture in it at 100%. And this is not a good idea. This is not what I want. I want to make sure that no matter what happens before Q5, Q5 keeps the look. So I'm actually I'm going to unblock Q5. And this is why we have a mode in our queue list called break. So if you open the sequence executor sheet, you'll find a mode here. Remember Q5 is my scene two. I'm gonna say break, and you notice you get a big white line. And in the tracking sheet, you get a big white line. So fixture channel 12, if I store this to Q2, merge, you'll notice it exists in Q4, but it, it does not exist in Q5. It's released. So um, what release does is it says, hey, remove this, this Q no longer has control of this fixture. Uh, you can actually change this functionality uh, by enabling a function called Q0. So Q0 on says anytime a I think uh, actually we want to, uh, do we want to extract? No, I think Q0 on says if I introduce this value in Q2, it adds it at default in Q1, and then in Q5, past the break, it stays at zero. So instead of releasing it, it just still controls it, but it goes to zero. So for any theater users out there, um, I think you'll really like the idea of break, and I would suggest Q0 on. So Q0 on says uh, would be useful when you're using moving lights, because if you've added pan tilt later on in your queue list, you'll see that you used it earlier in the queue list. So that's effectively 
my introduction to tracking. Um, we have a good, uh, I think, 25 minutes for questions. If there's more tracking related questions, I would encourage you to send those in and I will uh, certainly try to answer those right now. So. Yeah, hey Will, you've got a couple of good tracking questions actually. Um, why are some tracked values represented by magenta dots and others are represented by magenta values? Um, the dots are just MHA's way of displaying the value is at zero. And that's, that's just how they do it. So it, it applies to dimmer. Um, you'll notice it's closed. If it's if it's cyan or green or white, it would say closed. Uh, if it's tracked, it's a dot. Cool. Um, I'm going to try to word this one a little bit differently here. Um, when you store Q4 as Q only, and then let's say we change a value in Q2, will it track through the Q only to update Q5? You might want to read that one along there, Will. Read, read it again? Word it again? All right. If we, st uh, if we store Q4 as a Q only, and let then change the right value, now. all right? Let me, do, let me do that right now. So I store Q4 as a Q only. So let's say this, I'll set this to 65%, and I will store Q4, please, Q only merge, okay? All right. If you change a value in Q2, Will it track through the queue only to update Q5? Well, you can see from the queue from the track sheet, absolutely not, because 55 Q2 is tracked into Q3, and then there's a new value in Q4. There is no link between Q2, 3, and 5. So if I edit Q2 and make it 25%, it's 25 in Q3, 65, 55. So. The answer to that is no. Cool. All right. Hey, Will, um, how do I set a queue to record all parameters for my tracking? How do I set a queue to record all parameters? So if you want all attributes stored with every store action, this is a store option, which you get to by holding your store key and you would say to all. And if I do that, this is all attributes. It has nothing to do with selection, it's just every single channel and fixture that's in your, in your, uh, in your show, all the attributes. So if I did this, uh, all, uh, please. I just made my tracking sheet very huge because every single attribute has been stored. So. I hope that was the answer to that question. All right. Um, can you go over Q0 extract and is dealing with break the only use of Q0? No, dealing with break has nothing to do with Q0. It just, uh, I pointed it out because it prevents the release value. Um, Q0 is used to help you know that you've used stuff. So if I have channel one, uh, store, store, create second queue, store, store, store. And then I bring channel four into this. Um, technically, Q1 has no idea that channel four exists in my show. And you see channel four it doesn't even, is not even being controlled by the executor. So when you have six queues here, this is easy. If you have 100 queues, um, you can see this, store queue uh, seven through 99. And then I introduce uh, channel three into the mix. Uh, 
100. Now, I can see, I know channel 3 exists because it's at the top, but there's no value associated with it. So Q0 just brings the values in at their default. So now, when I run Q, when I run Q1, I see in my channel sheet that channel 3 is being used in the show. Um, so if you think about your designer who might only, your designer doesn't want to look at tracking sheets. Uh, he's looking at the channel sheet. Right now, he thinks, oh, oh look, channel 3 is never used. I want to use that for something. He has no idea that it's used later on in the show. So by enabling Q0, your designer is now looking at the channel sheet and says, oh, okay, so at some point I have used channel 1, 3, and 4, but I have all these other channels that obviously aren't used yet. Uh, so that's a function of Q0. Another thing is related to a cert. Um, if you're in a rock and roll type show and you have uh, default values, uh, let's say, um, will be a nice example of this. So this particular cue list, I have a stage view. Uh, turn that off. Um, Let me see if I can dream up an example of this. So this particular cue list has control of dimmer, position, and color. Now I might be working on a new, a new cue list, which my stage view back here. Uh, I bring the light on, and I store that here. And then point it on the guitar, and I would store that here as my second cue, and then I would bring in the color lavender, and store that as my third cue. So if we look at this tracking info, when you hit go on your first cue, that brings that light up. But technically, maybe when you created the look, it was pointed down like this. Um, because this other executor is running, uh, at the time you turn this on, pan tilt is not stolen away by executor 4. Color is not stolen away by executor 4. I can force this to occur by turning this on. And it might be sitting here. I want to hit go. Yeah, it asserts those tracked values which have automatically been added by Q0. Therefore, when you're building all these executors, um, you don't have to worry about remembering to activate everything that you plan to use with that fixture. You can just have Q0 automatically do it. Um, I'm told I forgot what Q0 extract does. Do you remember, Cat? Uh, no, I'm guessing the help manual is hopefully going to be helpful. Not where we use this. Okay. And we have Ryan chiming in. Q0 extract is in case you change your defaults later. Yeah, that's right, that's right. So Q0 references the default values when it, um, that's why the parentheses are here. So if I were to change these default values, suddenly these defaults would be different for the first Q. Uh, Q0 extract says, believe uh, extract the value Let's see what happens. Edit uh, fixture 101. I'm going to change. Oops. I'm going to change my color defaults to 50. So now my color defaults in the Q1 are at 50 because of Q0 extract. If I turn that off and I edit fixture one and I change these 
colors back to 100, you'll notice it doesn't work. Why is it not working? When this is on, it will extract the current default values and store them in the Q0. Okay, wait, I know where my example is wrong. The default values are already here. That's what the parentheses are for. Um, if I turn off Q0, Q0 goes away. I would want to enable Q0 extract, and uh, this is being very stupid. Uh, because these values already exist, Q0 extract is on. Let me put this at 100 and tilt it down stage and store this as my next queue. You'll notice this case, because I just added this and extract was on, it extracted the default values and put pan and tilt in there without the parentheses. So what does that tell you? It means make sure you have this setting enabled before you start storing information in there. If you go to enable this setting after the fact, it will not automatically convert this default parentheses uh, into an extracted value. Did I explain that so it makes sense to you, Kat? Because that means everybody else should. Yeah, that was actually really cool. Uh, you just got a like little standing ovation there. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. This is why if you use this a lot, it's good to save this as your default sequence options. All right. Cool. Well, cool. That's awesome. I have another cool question for you. Good. Is there a clever way to highlight groups of fixtures in the tracking sheet instead of going through all of my fixtures? Is there a clever way to highlight groups of fixtures in the tracking sheet? As in mask your fixture, or sorry, mask your tracking sheet so that you only see maybe a group of spots? Oh, yeah, so you would use the mask function for this. Um, maybe we shall select executor 30, which has a lot of fixtures in it. My favorite shortcut for this is, let's say I only want to see fixture 101, 102, and 103. I can select them and say assign fixture fixture, which is assign selection, and click on the title bar. And I get a little red ghost. Little red ghost says, hey, I'm masking only what you told me to mask. Um, I can do this by group as well. You could say I could find group five and tap on the title bar. Now little red ghost says only show me group five, which in this show is just uh, fixture 102. I don't know if this works. I'm going to try this with uh, preset type. I don't know if this works. Assign color here. Oh, yeah, it does work. So I just want to look at color information. I could say assign position and tap on the title bar. And by the way, if you guys have never used these red ghosts before, it's available in any sheet. So I could say assign dimmer and I get a little red ghost here. Or I could say assign color and I see this. Now the red ghost is the temporary mask. Uh, I have a tendency to prefer to set up my own masks, and I will usually set uh, my sheets. There's a nice button called Follow Selected Mask. Follow Mask. I usually like to enable this. And now as I click through the masks in my mask pool, all my sheets follow me. So if I uh, wanted an attribute mask, uh, attribute mask for just RGB, I would set that up. I would, yeah, this is automatically saved. So RGB only, it's labeled now. I select this, I see only RGB in any sheet that's set to follow selected mask. But like I said, something I do a lot is I base it off selection by using the shortcut assign selection here. Cool. Awesome. Next cool. question. All right. Tips and tricks on controlling multi-part fixture selection. 
Oh yes, we do not do this here. We already did a webinar on that. You should visit um, the Act Lighting uh, Tech Talks page and uh, watch the Matrix webinar. Uh, we cover all things related to multi-part fixtures and how to handle them, and including those pesky Roby ring fixtures. Cool. Oh. Cool. Hey, Will. Is it possible to view two different sequence executors at the same time? Oh yeah, you want to see this one and that one. Um, I guess in any sheet this is possible, so I'm going to put a Q sheet though. I'll use Q sheet here, the executor sheet. Um, in the yellow ball, there's always options. Assign executor one, and in this one, I want to assign executor two. You see, executor 1.1, executor 1.2, and this one is still set to follow my selected executor. So now that's 1.4, and in my tracking sheet, I want this to look at uh, executor 3. So yellow ball, very easy. Now you have many, all looking at different things. Next. All right. I'm going to switch gears on you a little here, Will. Uh, can you explain the MIB, different MIB modes? Oh, MIB early and late and Q. Um, I forgot what executor I had when I was showing this. That one? Um, get that view back. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is a good example. So. Um, Q8, remember, will MIB early. This says as soon as this fixture goes out in Q3 and it's totally dark, go ahead and mark it for the next Q where it comes on again. So right away it marks itself. Cool. Many people like this. They want their fixtures ready to go because if they're slamming through their queues really quick, they want to make sure it's ready uh, fast enough. Some people the, the one kind of downside associated with MIB early is um, you'll notice this is in cyan. Unfortunately, if you bring this to full, your designer thinks that it's in cyan. He's like, oh, this is great for Q4, store this. Well, what happens when you store this to Q4? Suddenly, uh, when you go into Q4, it's not cyan anymore, it's green. So some people don't really like moving black early. Uh, we're going to do, yeah, undo this update. Um, so then, maybe if you do a lot of rehearsing and stuff, maybe you want to do, uh, sorry, I'm clicking around a lot here, um, moving black late. Right. So that says, hey, moving black as late as possible. So, you know, I'm in Q4, it's still in green. That means if my designer turns that light back on, he still sees it in green. Well, what's the latest Q this can mark itself? Uh, Q7. So when you go into Q7, it will mark itself for the next Q. That's moving black late. Now, if you think about the theater show, uh, what if Q3 is a really quiet scene. You don't want things panning and tilting and color flags moving. Oh shit, what if Q7 is really quiet? You also don't want lights moving and pan and tilting and stuff. But maybe Q5 is a really noisy scene. And this is where you get to choose move in black in a specific queue. So I want it to move in black in Q5. So now, when I'm in Q3, it's still in green. And Q4 is still in green. And suddenly a really noisy scene is happening. Okay, all these lights can pan into and set their color, etc. And none of the audience doesn't notice. So then I pick it. And those are the different options with MIB. Um, if, by the way, if you're somebody that uses MIB a lot or you absolutely never want to use it, you have MIB always and MIB never. Cool. Next question. All right, I got a quick one for you. Is there a way to off all group masters on the desk? 
No, you can't really off all group masters because there are three types of group masters. There's additive, there's negative, and there's positive. So you don't off them, um, but you can manage them all by holding your groups key, and then you will see them all here. So if we assign group two here and assign the alpha beams here and assign the alpha washes here. You have three groups now. That group window is here. Um, you could say all positive to full, all negative to full, all additive to full, or zero depending on your preference. So remember there's three different types. So it's not the terminology would not be offing them. It would be either setting the positive inhibitors to full or zero, setting the negative inhibitors to full or zero, and setting the additives to full or zero. So remember, the hold the group hold the group key opens up your master's window. Cool. And this is a permanent view, by the way, that you can keep open if you want to save it to a view. All right. Um, is there a way to tell MA to keep the last LTP value instead of going back to default after releasing or clearing the programmer? No. Hmm. Um, I guess you would set up a, set up a macro that captured all the current values and stored it to a dummy executor that you would run. So I guess the macro would be like uh, on fixture through on, no, remember that store all that we learned. Uh, what is that setting? Store slash question mark gives me all the options. Uh, use something, something in here is Use selection, use, use slash use selection equals all. So I would say store uh, sequence 999, use selection equals all. And maybe I have already, I would assume that you have assigned your sequence 999 somewhere. Maybe here. So let's see. Store sequence 999, assign sequence 999 here. Uh, by the way, we also need to do an automatic slash overwrite. 999 is on executor 1.201. So I would say on executor 1.201. So now um, that basically stores every value in your show automatically to sequence 999 and then it just starts this executor which is not running everything which means you can clear your programmer and nothing changes on the stage. But you know, when you clear a programmer, uh, you're clearing the program. You don't want the programmer to have control of it anymore. Therefore it must go back to some other form of control which will either be default or go to a previous executor which is why you could have this this macro store sequence slash use selection equals all slash overwrite on the executor where that sequence is assigned. Um, hopefully that gives you a little trick that might work for your situation. And I guess we have time for one more question. Um, does MIB mode reference individual color time? No, 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 no. So I had to think about that for a second. There's a default MIB timing. Uh, so the MIB delay, it waits 0.5 seconds before it does the move, and then the default fade time for MIB is two seconds. So it takes that long. Now there is a function of the fixture profile if you're working with scrollers or something. Uh, so a scroller would be like a color wheel. Uh, you can disable MIB if you want it, or you can set a default time. So maybe your normal uh, overall MIB timing is one second, but for a scroller, you need that to be like four seconds. So in the scroller fixture profile, I would set this to four seconds. 
second. Cool. Was well, there anything real quick I should try to answer, or is that it, Kat? Uh, I think everything else is a little bit more detailed. Some of the questions actually have to do with uh, future webinars. So um, hopefully we'll get to those in the future. Yeah. Remember, you can always email support at actlighting.com. Um, there is the ACT YouTube page. The particular playlist you're looking for is the Tech Talks, where you'll see a lot of these. Uh, remember, the ACT support page uh, exists. Uh, there's the uh, support tab. And you go to Grumman 2, and we see all this stuff. By the way, as promised, uh, all you guys that wanted the parallel settings, uh, this is up there now. You can take a look at it. Be aware, this is very specific hardware that we're using with very specific versions of Parallels and Windows. I cannot promise that Parallels will work efficiently for you on your hardware if it does not match what we posted here. And remember, Parallels is for non-show critical applications. Um, if you have any other questions, email support.com. It's been a pleasure, you guys. Happy programming.